Uh, I'm very honored to be here with you. I want to thank Cardinal Mueller for inviting me to this colloquium. Thank you. I want to thank Archbishop Tenoya for introducing me, and I thank all of you for caring enough about this topic. You know, there's always a danger in being uh, the 28th speaker. <laughs> <laughs> What's left to say? Uh, and after hearing so many great speakers yesterday, um, I canceled my dinner engagement last night to go write a new message because what I had prepared to say uh, had already been said over and over and over. Uh, I had prepared a message called Why Marriage Matters, but I didn't want to repeat what you have heard many, <laughs> many times. Uh, I actually had prepared uh, to speak on how God reveals his presence and his character uh, through marriage, but that was eloquently explained by Cardinal Mueller. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I then had prepared to speak on the specific ways that our lives and our culture and especially our children are damaged when we reject God's plan for marriage and sex. Uh, but that was eloquently explained by Pastor Arnold. Thank you. Uh, I then had prepared to speak about how gender ideology, ideologies confuse our identity and destroy our dignity. But of course, Sister Prudence brilliantly explained that. Now I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> and then, I'm not kidding, uh, part of my message had prepared to speak about how the covenant of marriage and the act of sex parallel our intimate relationship uh, with God and the one that he wants to have with us. But then my former friend, Rabbi Sachs, <laughs> powerfully explained that one. <sighs> so what would you guys like to talk about? <laughs> Uh, with every single speaker, I kept finding myself crossing out more and more of my speech. So in conclusion, <laughs> um, I now understand what the Lord Jesus felt when he said in John 10, 8, all who come before me are thieves and robbers. <laughs> so I had to write a whole new message, and I'm not kidding, I did. Uh, Hebrews 13... Too, too strong, this interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews 13, 4 says this. We're given this very clear command. Marriage is to be honored by everybody. Whether you're single, married, divorced, annulled, widowed, the Bible says you are to honor marriage. Now, sadly, today, we all know marriage is dishonored by a lot of people. It's dismissed as archaic man-made tradition. It's denounced as an enemy of women. It's discouraged as a career-limiting career choice. It's demeaned in movies and television. It's delayed out of fear that it will limit one's personal freedom. So today, instead of being honored, marriage is ridiculed, resented, rejected, and redefined. What are we going to do about this? Well, the church cannot cower in silence. As you've already heard from all these great speakers and from these great film clips, the stakes are too high. We, we cannot not do something. Uh, so after all of what we've heard, I, I sat down and detailed a little action plan for myself, and possibly maybe you might want to do some of these things after the colloquium ends. And so rather than speaking on why marriage matters, uh, I want to speak on my new title, What Must We Do? There you go. Okay. What, what, what are we going to do? And uh, I have a number of suggestions here, and just for fun, I put them in alphabetical order. <laughs> so if you're taking notes... A is this, affirm the authority of God's word. That's the starting point. We don't base our worldview on fads or feelings or opinions or political correctness. We build our lives on the unchanging truth of God's word. Jesus affirmed heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Isaiah affirmed the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God abides forever. And David affirmed, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. You see, truth 
is still truth, no matter how many people doubt it. And I may deny the law of gravity, but it doesn't change gravity. And just because we break law, God's laws does not invalidate them. We don't really actually break God's laws. They, they break us. And everything in this planet is broken. So we start with affirming the authority of God's word. Second thing we need to do, B, believe what Jesus taught about marriage. We just need to believe it what Jesus taught about marriage. And in Mark chapter 10, verses 6 to 9, we have the owner's manual for marriage. In America, we have a phrase, when in doubt, check the owner's manual. And in Mark chapter 10, verses 6 to 9, Jesus quotes the Old Testament and gives us, as I said, the owner's manual on marriage. A lot of speakers have referred to this. Uh, let me read it to you from the New Living Translation. God's plan has been seen from the very beginning of creation when he made us male and female. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united as one body. Now since they are no longer two but one, no one should separate them for God has joined them together. Now, in this one passage, just one single passage, Jesus gives us the five convictions about marriage that are unchangeable, incontrovertible, and unmovable. Five convictions we must believe. First, and this has been referred to many times, gender is God's idea. God chose to make us either male or female. Our identity is either a man or a woman. And it's far deeper than a sociological construct, a psychological condition, a personal preference. God made us male and female. Second, this passage teaches that marriage is God's idea. He defines it. He defines it, not us. It's not a man-made idea that we can just toss away. God created marriage. Number three, sex was created for marriage. God created the male and female body parts to fit naturally together. That's obvious. But they don't just fit together, they fit together for a purpose. And that is the creation of life. And even if you disbelieve the Bible, every human body and every living person is a witness and a testimony to God's intended purpose for sex. Sex was not created for recreation, but it was created for connection of a husband and wife and a procreation of life. By the way, when a husband and wife make love, it releases oxytocin into their bodies. Oxytocin is the chemical, the bonding chemical that creates emotional closeness. Oxytocin, if you're high in oxytocin, you have an easy ability to relate to people. If you're low in oxytocin, you have a hard time making connections with people. When a husband and wife make love, it releases oxytocin in both the husband and the wife, and it bonds them together. It is a, an emotional cement. By the way, when a woman nurses a baby, it releases oxytocin in both the woman and the mother and the baby. Studies have shown that um, if you own a pet and you have a dog and you pet a dog for 30 minutes, it releases oxytocin in both the dog and the owner. They've done studies about oxytocin. There's an animal in the Midwest in America called the prairie vole. It's like a little hamster. And prairie voles are one of the few animals in the animal kingdom that actually mate for life. And when they studied um, the prairie voles, they found that they were off the chart in oxytocin. And that's why they, it, they connect with a mate and bond for life. And they discovered that when they took the oxytocin out of um, uh, the prairie voles, they were as promiscuous as rabbits. Now, God created sex for not just the procreation of new life, but for the connection of a husband and a woman. And if sex was only physical, then unfaithfulness would not hurt anybody. But it does, because it's far more than just physical. And uh, when I was a youth pastor, I used to tell kids there's no such thing as safe sex because they don't make a condom that can prevent a broken heart. It's far more than physical. Now, the fourth thing Jesus said in that passage was that marriage is the union of a man and a woman. Now, there are many other kinds of relationships, but those aren't marriage. And definitions matter. And then fifth, 
In that passage, it says marriage is to be permanent. Jesus repeats Genesis saying, what God has joined together, uh, no human being should separate. So it's meant to last a lifetime. Now, we know that all five of those truths that I just gave you are disputed, debated, and denied today. Every one of them. But a lie doesn't become a truth, and wrong doesn't become right, and evil doesn't become good just because it becomes popular. Truth is truth. So we affirm the authority of Scripture, and we believe what Jesus said uh, about marriage and sex. Number three, C, celebrate healthy marriages. It's not enough to defend marriage. We have to celebrate it. We have to celebrate it. Uh, we have to be a proponent of what's right, not simply an opponent of what's wrong. Uh, we have to offer an appealing alternative uh, to the empty promises of the world. And celebrating and highlighting and honoring marriage, I believe, is the best defense. When you show people what's real. Now, how do you do that? I'm a pastor. So let me give you, if you are a pastor, parish priest, or if you're over some uh, priest, uh, let me give you some suggestions for a local church to celebrating healthy marriage. Number one, use testimonies of happy marriages in your church services. We need more testimonies. People need less uh, hear a sermon. They need more see a sermon. And both single adults and married couples are actually inspired more by example than they are by exhortation. So we have these testimonies in our church, but people never hear them. And if you could, can incorporate them into your services, um, a marriage doesn't have to be perfect to be healthy. Last month, uh, Kay and I sat on stage uh, at our church for six services in a row and talked about how our nearly 40 years of marriage has been worth all the effort. Now, our marriage was not perfect. In fact, the two years is pretty much hell on earth. Uh, we said, we're going to make this marriage last. If it kills us, it nearly did. Uh, Kay thought she was going crazy, and I, I ended up in the hospital. Uh, we uh, went and got 15 weeks of marriage counseling in the early years of our marriage. It cost me $100 a week, and I was making $400 a month. It's easy to figure out that I put it on my credit card. I've often said I should do a commercial. MasterCard saved my marriage. <laughs> a saved marriage? Priceless. <laughs> and... and when, uh, when people say, well, I can't afford counseling, I say, how much is your happiness worth? Really? To me, what I've got today is worth a million dollars. My wife is my best friend. There would be no Saddleback Church. There would be no purpose-driven life, no movement, no training of over 400,000 pastors in 164 countries. None of that would have ever happened if our marriage had fallen apart. And so, whatever it takes. But have testimonies of happy marriages. Second, I would encourage you to do an annual wedding renewal of vows service. We do one every year at Saddleback. I take an entire weekend. We dress up. We invite people to wear their original wedding gowns if they can still get on them. <laughs> we have a processional, and we do a renewal of the vows every year at Saddleback Church. Uh, it's a very tender service. People weep, and it's a great model. And by the way, we found couples who were living together who said uh, we would like to get married. We always announce it several months in advance so they can take our eight weeks of premarital counseling, <coughs> repent, and get married. And we do that. Number three, publicly recognize and reward long-term marriages in your parishes. Whatever gets rewarded gets repeated. Amen. So whatever you want repeated... That kind of behavior, you need to figure out a way to reward it. And you need to reward anniversaries. And you need to honor them and celebrate the sweetness and the beauty of a love that lasts a lifetime because we're, we're wired to crave this. And then another thing, continually point out the benefits of marriage is a good way to celebrate healthy marriages. For instance, when a culture claims, and in Western culture we claim this, to care about children, we must point out that children who grow up with both mom and a father uh, grow up healthier, happier, and stronger. They're less likely to fail in school, less likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, less likely to do jail time, less likely to experience distress, depression, thoughts of suicide. They're also less likely to perpetuate the problems in the next generation. So do you really care about kids? Then promote marriage. 
lasting marriage. Uh, when a culture claims to champion women, uh, we must point out that those who marry, women who marry and stay married, have lower rates of depression, have a lower risk of being a victim of crime or violence, and have a higher net worth than the women living with an unmarried man. When a culture claims to care about the poor, we must point out that the dissolution of marriage disproportionately hurts the poor. A single mother with a child has never been a viable economic unit. That's why God created fathers. And poor children get hurt the most by the eco economic consequences of divorce. Children who grow without both mother and father are more likely to live their entire lives in poverty. It's just a fact. And what about men? Men who marry and stay married have fewer illnesses, have fewer injuries, and live longer than single men. They earn more money, amass more net worth than single men with similar education and job histories, including the men who live with unmarried women. D. Here's a fourth thing. Develop small groups, small group courses to support marriages. I believe the small group unit in the church is the healthiest expression to support marriages. Twice in Scripture, in the book of Acts, it tells us that in the New Testament church, they met in the temple courts and from house to house. Twice. Large group worship and small group fellowship. And we have done this and developed it at Saddleback. We have small groups that study marriage all the time. It's one of the keys to our growth. Last Saturday, I was in Berlin at Saddleback Berlin and uh, teaching pastors and priests there how to start small groups for the new evangelization. I started Saddleback Church 35 years ago with a one member, my wife. I, I preached the first sermon. She said it was too long. <laughs> it's been downhill ever since. She still says they're too long. Uh, today, Saddleback is the only church in America with more people in small groups than come on Sunday. Uh, last Sunday, we had, I don't know, maybe 25,000 people in attendance, but we have about 40,000 involved in small groups, uh, in 8,400 small groups. And they go from Santa Monica to San Diego in California. And one of the things we teach in small groups, that as a couple, you should never have as your best friends couples who are not as committed to their marriage as you are. If you want your marriage to last, you should choose as your best friends couples who are as committed to their marriage as you are. Because if not, when the heat is on, you're going to go the wrong way. They're going to give you bad advice. They're not going to support you. They're not going to fight uh, for your marriage. So develop small groups. E is engage every media to promote marriage. This is something we really need to do. We need to engage every single media to promote marriage. Right now, friends, the church is being outmarketed by the opponents of marriage. Everybody agree with that? Um, and the minority view is getting the majority of the press. And they're, they're the minority. They are so far the minority. And yet you would think that they were uh, the, the majority. And right now, uh, Christians, we are more known for what we're against than what we're for. I think we need to change that. I intend to change it. And whichever side tells the best stories wins. So we have to tell better stories about marriage and about sex. I was so excited, and I was telling Monsignor Stephen how much I appreciate these videos we've been watching. We need more of these. And every, every church should show these and, and use them in your services so that we're not just the ones that are seeing them. But that, but that everybody is seeing them. And we need more TV shows. We need more movies that portray joyful, committed marriages. When was the last time you saw a happy marriage on television? The, the father is usually a joke. On, on, and uh, in, in, in most Disney movies, the mom and dad are absent. I don't know if you've noticed this, but almost every Disney character is an orphan dad is never around or mom's never around or they're killed off early in the scene. <laughs> we have to use media to question what I call the cultural lies. 
And the lies that are being perpetuated in our culture are told over and over and over, and people simply believe them because they're not being questioned. For instance, one of the lies we have in our culture is um, that the only great sex is sex outside of marriage. We hear this all the time. Uh, you, you, you never see a loving couple of, that are husband and wife on TV. Sex is always between single people or adultery. Yeah. And uh, I think we need tasteful movies and TV that celebrate sex and marriage. That's right. They could be done sec uh, tastefully. Sex is not dirty. It is holy. It is holy. And it is a gift to married couples. I'm so glad the Rivers are here today. <laughs> All I just want to say is they're my kind of people, you know. Just, uh, you have honorary membership at Saddleback. God bless you. Uh, we need movies and we need films and we need stories that teach the difference between love and lust. Thank you. Yes. Most love songs today are not really love songs, they're lust songs. Right. Give it to me, give it to me, or I'm going to take it. That's not love. <laughs> That's not love. Love can always wait to give. Lust can never wait to get. Now, uh, as Christians and we represent a lot of different tribes here. We need a cooperative media strategy for producing television shows, films, and YouTube videos that portray the joys and benefits of healthy marriage and the hard work it takes to maintain a great marriage. And by the way, on a personal level, I want to encourage every one of you, no matter who you are, to use the social media to mentor the next generation. If you want to mentor the next generation, you have to be on social media because that's where they are. They're on Facebook and MySpace and YouTube and they're on Twitter and Instagram and Google Plus and LinkedIn. And I'm on nine different uh, accounts. And by the way, if you're not following me on Twitter, you're going to hell. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> F. We must face attackers with joy and winsomeness. We must face attackers, the critics, with joy and win. Yes, there's a, a raging cultural battle. Uh, but the Bible says we don't use the weapons of this world. We don't use the weapons of this world. And the Bible says you overcome evil with what? Yeah, good. With good. And, and the Bible tells us to bless those who curse you. These attackers are not the enemy. They are the mission field. That's right. They're people that Jesus shed his precious blood for. Right. He wants them in heaven. And sometimes you have to decide, are you, are, you, are you more interested in making a point or making a friend? My definition of evangelism is you build a bridge of love between your heart and theirs and Jesus walks across. Before people will trust Christ, they've got to trust you. And before they want to know, is he real? They want to know, are you real? Can you be trusted? And so we face attackers with joy and winsomeness. I have done hundreds, maybe thousands uh, of interviews with antagonistic reporters. Um, and I will have to say, I've learned, you never get your point across by being cross. And you are never persuasive uh, when you're abrasive. That is, it is in winsomeness that we, that we win the battle. And um, our culture has accepted two lies today. One of them is that if you disagree with somebody's lifestyle, then you either hate them or you're afraid of them. I don't hate them, and I'm not afraid of them. I'm not phobic, and I'm not hateful. I just disagree. And that's, that's, that's a myth. And the other is that if you love somebody, you must agree with everything they believe or do. Well, that's nonsense because nobody agrees with everything you do, including your wife <laughs> or your husband or whatever. Both of those are nonsense. Uh, I, I said earlier, over the past 35 years, I've had the privilege of training over 400,000 pastors in 164 countries. And one of the things I've learned in talking to that many pastors is that every leader needs to learn how to represent Christ when attacked. And if you stand courageously for the truth, you're going to be attacked. You can count on it.
So how do you stay winsome under attack? How do you do that? Well, let me give you a couple ways. Number one is remember the reward you're going to get. Remember the reward. Jesus said it like this in the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. This is not the end of the story. And we must be willing to be ridiculed and even suffer for the truth. Courage by its very nature means that sometimes you have to take a stand that's unpopular. And I meet a lot of pastors and priests who are afraid to be unpopular. You cannot plead. You have to do what St. Peter said. We must obey God rather than men. When the Sanhedrin took them in. You know, um, in the concluding message at the end of the Extraordinary Synod, the Holy Father said this, we must avoid, quote, the temptation to come down off the cross, to please the people instead of staying on the cross, fulfilling the will of the Father, the temptation to bow down to a worldly spirit instead of purifying it and bending it to the Spirit of God. Wow. Wow. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. So you remember your reward. And the other thing you do is you live for an audience of one. That you don't care about really what other people think. Uh, if you haven't got people's approval by now, you're not going to get it. <laughs> but, and I'll tell you this, you don't need it to be happy. You don't need it to be happy. Um, remember who is the one that we are answering to at the end of the day. It's not Time Magazine. It's Jesus Christ. I remember one time I was interviewed on CNN, and I've, every time I'd go on there, they'd ask me the same question about gay marriage. And uh, one of the well-known speakers on CNN asked me, said, Rick, as a pastor, do you ever think you will ever change your, your opinion on this? And I said, no. And he said, why? And I said, because I fear the disapproval of God more than I fear di your disapproval or the disapproval of society. And, and I wasn't saying that in a mean way. I was just trying to be honest. Uh, the only way to always be relevant is to be eternal. Anything that is in style is going out of style. By its very nature, styles go out of style. So you should never try to be stylish. No, you know, no revolution lasts, including the sexual revolution. No dictator lasts, no, no revolution lasts, and every lie eventually crumbles under its own deception. Cultures rise and fall, they come and go, but the word of God and the church of God continues. So what I'm saying is it isn't necessary to be on the side of culture. It's not even necessary to be on the right side of history. It's just important to be on the right side. Okay. I guess what I'm saying is that uh, the debate over the definition of life and of sex and of marriage is in reality a question of leadership. And the question is, who's going to lead? Yes, sir. Will the church follow the crowd or will the church lead the crowd? Yes, yes. And in Exodus 23, 2, God says this, do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. Why? Because history shows the majority is often wrong. Remember Hitler? The dustbins of history are stuffed with conventional wisdom of cultures that proved false, and truth is not decided by a popularity contest. G, give people confidence. This is something we need. Give them confidence that their marriage can make it. Uh, two of the Catholic leaders that I respect the most, and I've talked about this, Archbishop Kurtz told me, he said, Rick, we must restore confidence that even in a broken world, a biblical marriage is attainable. Brilliant. And, uh, and Cardinal Chapu right here say, has said, believers don't have the luxury of pessimism. That's great. We must give people confidence. We must preach the good news about marriage with hope and faith, not doom and gloom. This is important. Instead of merely telling it like it is, pastors must tell it like it can be. Telling it like it is, it, 
changes nothing. It just labels people. And la- if somebody says, you're a bad uh, husband, then you tend to say, yes, I am a bad husband. Look how bad I can be. But if somebody says, I see in you the potential to be a great husband. I see in you the potential to be a man of God that your wife loves, your kids honor, the community respects. This could be you with God's Holy Spirit in and through you. That changes me. This is preaching for faith. Preaching for faith. Give people confidence. The good news of marriage with hope and faith. We can show that they can beat the odds, Jesus said, according to your faith. It will be done to you. We must help couples imagine, imagine how good their marriage could be if they'll just make the effort to improve it. And we must help people, this is important, help people see that their primary identity is found in Christ, not their sins or any other distinction. Help people see that their primary identity is in Christ, not their sins or any other distinction. Before I left Los Angeles, I had lunch with uh, Archbishop Gomez, and we talked about this um, issue of identity, which we both feel very deeply about. Uh, Let me just give you an example. At Saddleback, we have a recovery program based on the Beatitudes. We started it 25 years ago. Tens of thousands of people have been through it through Saddleback around the world. It's called Celebrate Recovery. And it's based on the Beatitudes of Jesus as the steps of recovery. And one of the things that makes Celebrate Recovery different from uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is if you go to AA meeting, at every meeting, you stand up and for the rest of your life, you say, hi, I'm John and I'm an alcoholic. Your primary identity is your sin, your weakness. Uh, And Celebrate Recovery said, no, no, you don't do that. You would say, hi, uh, my name Rick is uh, Rick, and I'm a disciple of Christ who struggles with alcohol. See the difference? My primary identity is in Christ, and I'm just struggling with an area uh, in my life. That makes a huge difference in theology and practice. Uh, finally, um, teach the purposes of marriage. I skipped all the way to T because I'm out of time. <laughs> teach the purposes of marriage. You cannot value something you don't understand its purpose. Now, any time we forget God's purpose for any of his gifts, that gift's going to be misused, abused, confused, wasted, perverted, and even destroyed. It's true of your time, your money, your health, um, your gifts, your freedom, your sexuality, even, even marriage. Now, the Bible primarily in Genesis, uh, gives us the six purposes of marriage. And I'll close with this. And we've discussed these at the conference, but let me just summarize them in a list. The Bible says that there are six purposes for marriage. Number one, for the elimination of loneliness. It's the first thing God said. Genesis 1.18, God tells Adam, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make you a companion. It's the first thing God said. Elimination of loneliness. Number two, for the expression of sex. Genesis 2, 24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Elimination of loneliness, expression of sex. Number three, the multiplication of the human race. 128, Genesis 128. God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. By the way, this is the only command of God that the human race has ever been able to keep. <laughs> we, we did this one successfully. There are seven billion of us to prove it. Number four, by the way, uh, it always amazes me that God chose to bring people into the world through sex so that Jesus could bring them into heaven. So think about this. Jesus told that this, there's going to be no sex in heaven. But without sex on earth, there'd be no people to go to heaven. Number four, for the protection and the education of children. Ephesians 4, 6, 4. God says, fathers, bring up your children in the nurture and the instruction, protection and education, in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. And a lot of people have already pointed out that children are hurt the most in a culture that devalues marriage. I love the... I love the message paraphrase of Malachi 2.18. Let me read this to you. God 
not you, made marriage. His spirit inhabits even the smallest detail of marriage. And what does he want from marriage? Godly children from your union. So guard the spirit of marriage within you. That's beautiful. The fifth purpose, for the perfection of our character. 1 Corinthians 7, 14 tells us very clearly, the husband is sanctified through his wife and the wife is sanctified through her husband. One of the purposes of the marriage is to make you holy, not just happy. Now, holiness creates happiness, but marriage is the laboratory for learning how to love. It is the school for learning sacrifice. It's the university for learning unselfishness. It's the lifelong course for becoming like Christ. And if you are married, the number one tool God uses to shape you is your spouse. And then number six, the sixth purpose of marriage, for the reflection of our union with Christ. Ephesians 4, 5, 22 to 33, a very powerful passage explains that marriage is a metaphor. Marriage is a model of the mystery of Christ's love for his bride and his body. It is a spiritual object lesson. Paul explained it this way. Let me read this to you. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy and to present her as a beautiful bride to himself, a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or blemish, but holy and pure. In this same way, husbands must love their wives as their own bodies. And he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds it and he cares for it just as Christ does his church for we are members of Christ's body. It is for this reason that a man will leave his father and mother, there it is again, and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and his church. So, each of you must also love your wife as you love yourself, and your wife, you wife must respect your husband. This is the deepest meaning of marriage. This is the most profound purpose of marriage. And this is the strongest reason why marriage can only be between a man and a woman. There is no other relationship, including the parent-child relationship, that can picture this intimate union. And to redefine marriage would destroy the picture that God intends for marriage to portray. And we cannot cave on this issue. It's a picture of Christ in his church. Jesus said, there's no marriage in heaven. Why? Because you're not going to need any of these six reasons. In heaven, you're not going to need, we're not going to need the protection of children. In heaven, we're not going to need the connection between men and women. We're not going to need the perfection of character. And we're not even going to need the reflection of our union with Christ. We don't need the metaphor because now we've got the real thing. So in closing, I just threw out the other message because I wanted to encourage you to never give up and to never give in. The church cannot be salt and light in a crumbling culture if we cave into the sexual revolution and if we fail to provide a counterculture witness. It is a total myth that we must compromise and give up on biblical truth and marriage in order to evangelize. And people say, well, the reason people aren't coming to church is because we're too we're too sick. That's just not true. 20 years ago, I wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Church. And the subtitle of that book was called Growth Without Compromising Your Message and Your Mission. And I think we proved it. Last month, I baptized the 40,000th adult convert at Saddleback Church. 
40,000 adult converts. And we didn't compromise and we didn't cave in. Now in the end, we have to be merciful to the fallen. We have to show grace to the struggling. We have to be patient to the doubting. But when God's word is clear, we must not, we cannot back up, back down, back off, backslide, or just give in. The church must never be captivated by culture, manipulated by critics, motivated by applause, frustrated by problems, debilitated by distractions, or intimidated by evil. We must keep running the race with our eye on the goal, not on those shouting from the sideline. We must be spirit-led, purpose-driven, and mission-focused so that we cannot be bought, we will not be compromised, and we shall not quit until we finish the race. May God bless you and all who serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.